Hi, my name is Alexandra and I'm a bibliophile. Welcome back to A Lovely Jaunt where we read better, not more. We are continuing our discussion of The Song of Roland, an 11th century French uh, medieval epic poem. And I have my notes here. Let's dive right in. So first of all, I'd actually like to rescind a comment I made sort of offhandedly yesterday. I have a tendency to dislike it when other booktubers or people on the internet say like, oh, no one's doing this thing. And I kind of offhandedly said, no one's talking about medieval literature. Obviously, I don't know that. There could be some really great channels out there that I just haven't found yet. And, um, <laughs> and it, I mean, there could be people out there who know a lot more about medieval literature than I do who are like, oh my gosh, this girl doesn't even, she doesn't even know what she's talking about. And she's not recognizing that we exist. So. I wanted to rescind that comment. So we're in the middle of the convocation, the sort of conversation that Charlemagne is having with his lords, deciding of what to do. And we wrapped up with Roland talking about how he wanted to, uh, basically he distrusted the suit for peace. He pointed to a previous situation where the representatives from Charlemagne were beheaded and that he thought we should just continue uh, attacking Sargosa. All of the other French lords, however, vote for peace. And here we see a really good picture of a constitutional king. Ganelon is also selected by consensus to be the representative to go to Marsilian. And I think he, in this kind of structure, this symbolic representation of Charlemagne, which we now find out is 200 years old, so he's now taken on these mythic, epic proportions in conjunction with the symbolism that we talked about for him as sort of like an earthly representative of God the Father. So with that, plus the constitutional monarchy type situation going on, we actually have a really good picture of sort of free will theology for the Christian faith because we see that it Charlemagne kind of lets how you know, the chips fall where they may, the let, he lets the votes fall. So even when Roland comes out and he gives a very bold and strong speech, he doesn't say yes or no to him. He lets the other opinions come through and he goes where and makes the decision based on the consensus of the group of lords. He doesn't necessarily override one person or another. And that's in juxtaposition with what we see Marsilian doing, who's much more represented as a barbarian type king, if you will. Ganelon, of course, doesn't want to go, probably because the other two representatives got their beheaded, but he requests to have his sins absolved before he goes. And one thing that I think is really different here compared to some of the other medieval literature that I've read, so if we kind of look at, say, Beowulf, it's very epic in the same way that Beowulf is epic, in the same way that it's dealing with these sort of male hierarchies, male relationships. It's not a romance, as we see a later developing, like I've talked about yesterday, but it's also not pagan in its roots, the way that Beowulf is. So Beowulf really feels quite pagan to its roots, with maybe a little bit of a, a Christian moral slapped on the top. This really feels like it's Christianized, written from a Christian perspective down to its bones. So I'm seeing these kind of like nuances and flavors between some of these epic poems that I've read and I'm familiar with. Um, the style seems very straightforward and very perfunctory. So we don't get a lot of discourses of, you know, description, sort of the poetry rambling off and talking about different things. We don't get a lot of, you know, inner world building where we see the psychology of various characters. The characterization is really based and developed through their actions and their speech, but particularly their speech, I was really impressed by how strongly, even in the form of the poetry, the different voices of the characters came through. Particularly Roland is quite distinctive. Um, oh, I, and the other thing that sort of made me think like, oh, this is quite a perfunctory style is when I compared the way that they describe Ganelon getting ready, getting his armor on to go visit Marsilian and be the representative of the peace treaty. We get like two lines of like arming poetry where he says, describes the armor that he puts on, you know, and I think about what Homer would do with that, what uh, we would see in the Iliad or the Odyssey, these long scenes of arming and describing the armor and that sort of thing. And that's really what made it stick out to me is like, oh no, we, 
We put on this and this and this and this. Off on our horse, off we go. We see that Gamelon immediately starts bad-mouthing Roland and put, sets into action almost immediately this plot to kill him. And part of the plot is that when Gamelon returns, he says that the Caliph refuses to be a part of the treaty that Marsilian is falsely promising to do. And the Caliph took his 400,000 men away. And this is really speaking to the idea. And, and one, on the literary level, it creates a really nice parallelism where we have the court of Marsilian in his kingship. And then we have the court of Charlemagne in his kingship and how they each sort of rule and deal with their lords and make decisions and blah, 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 are compared and contrasted. But essentially the poet is assuming that they have the same sort of hierarchical structure that we talked about last time. Time, which is that if a lesser lord sort of leaves the battlefield or decides not to fight, he takes his men with him. The men are loyal to the person that's closest to them, and that's the, the, the situation that Ganelon is lying about, it turns out, to, to Charlemagne, but it's still assuming that same kind of structure that we actually see in feudal France. And then the other thing that this does is that it actually reveals his intent, that that's for his plan for Roland. And this is an interesting thing about the way that the structure of lies work, or at least the way this one does, is that that's what Ganelon is banking on will happen when Roland falls, is that all of the men who are loyal to Roland will leave the French army. I, as an example of Roland's speech and what Roland's boldness, I particularly noted the uh, number 59. Oh, right, right, right. So this is where he promises that he's going to, you know, protect the rear guard. He's going to lead the rear guard. So this is basically like Charlemagne is leaving. He's going to be a, a, towards the front of that procession, but all of his army and support and food and all of these lines that have been reaching the army, because they've all been traveling on horseback or foot, is going to be following him. And so you need a contention of soldier, soldiers to protect the back of that section of people. So Roland has been appointed to this and he's like, not one, you know, not a palfrey or a saddle beast or a hinny or a mule, not not one thing will be missing. I, I will protect every single one. So he's being very dramatic. It's pretty fun. But it really speaks to his characterization because none of the other characters talk like that. And it also speaks to his rashness because Charlemagne sort of says like, oh, I'm going to leave this contingent of soldiers with you. And, and Roland is like, no, I will take far fewer. It's really never a good idea to contradict the sort of symbolic representation of God the Father on earth when he sort of says, here's a thing you should do, and you say, no, I don't need that. Probably a bad idea. So it sort of sets up Roland's folly for what we know is going to be coming. We get introduced also to Marcillian's nephew. So here we have that same nephew-uncle dynamic that I've talked about with medieval literature in the past. We even get it um, with Hamlet. And ultimately what it comes down to is that power was uh, inherited matrilineally in many Breton tribes, and that sort of becomes a trope within these stories. And that's why you would might have tension between a king and his nephew, because it would be the nephew on, you know, if his wife, the queen, had a sister or a brother and they were married and had kids. And if the king himself didn't have a king, then it would go to the sort of aunt and uncle child on the wife's side of the family, not on his side of the family. And so that would be a potential point of tension. Not so in this book, but the nephew does say that he wants 12 lords, which we see is the same structure that Charlemagne has. Charlemagne has 12 lords. And again, I think this goes back to sort of Christian numerology, Christian imagery. We have the 12 tribes of Israel. We have the 12 disciples. It's this really important number in biblical uh, imagery, really. And I think it really speaks to, again, that sense that like this story is Christian down to its bones. It's not a Christian ethic or moral kind of layered on top of a much older story. So that is what I have for you today. I think I'll probably finish the rest of this and then over the course of the next two days, Thursday and Friday, hopefully we'll wrap it up by the end of this week. And until next time, famous last words, that's what you said about Emma but this book is actually really skinny. But uh, anyway, <laughs> until next time, my name is Alexandra, and I'm still a bibliophile.